Hey, good morning, Stafford Crossing. Hey, it is great to see you here this morning. Hey, we're in part three of a series on the life of Daniel. It's called Daniel, an Uncompromising Life. So if you're new with us, I would encourage you, or maybe you missed a week along the way, to go to our website, or you can check out our mobile app, where you can watch the messages that you happen to miss there. For this morning, go ahead and turn in or turn on your Bible to the book of Daniel. If you're new to studying God's Word and you're going like, I don't know how to find that, if you have a paper edition, there's a beautiful thing in the front of this book, like most books, called a table of contents. If you look in the Old Testament, you scroll about two-thirds of the way down, you find Daniel and find that page number. We're going to be in chapter 1 in a second. If you have an electronic Bible with you, you can scroll about two-thirds of the way down in the list and you will see the book of Daniel. Just put a finger there, hold it there, we'll get there in a sec. You know, um, when you hit about the age of five in life, you end up spending roughly the next two decades getting an education. You know, you're in school, getting training, learning, and growing in all kinds of different ways. In our culture, in our environment, you have a lot of options. If you have a young one, you can say, wow, you know, they're going to go and they're going to attend a, a public school. Um, we're going to pay the money and we're going to do a private school, a Christian school. Uh, we're going to bypass those. We're going to homeschool. There's all kinds of options. When you get to the next level, you have choices between secular colleges and secular universities and a Christian school, a Christian college, a Christian university. All along the way, there's all of these options for education taking place. Some of us will end up in a job or an environment where it's not just the education, but the employer does some training. Maybe it's in the workforce, maybe it's in the military, government sector. All of a sudden, it's like, here's a job I'm hiring you to do, and I'm going to train you, I'm going to teach you how to do it. And so there's some training that goes apart with that kind of environment. The training that is needed is specialized. It depends on what you do. In the study that we're having right now about the life of Daniel, there is some training specifically that Daniel and his buddies are receiving from the king. They're going to like, hey, we see something in you, and we're going to train you to do what we want you to do. And this training wasn't just job skills. It was really an indoctrination. It was a remaking. It's like, hey, you were Israelites when you showed up as a POW here. We're going to do something different. And now you are going to be a Babylonian. And we're going to teach and train you exactly who you are and what you want to be down to the very changing of your name. From a Jewish name to a Babylonian name. You are going to be reshaped and remade. Daniel and his buddies were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar overtook Israel and they're taken as prisoners of war. And they began this indoctrinational program in a place called Babylon, which is present-day Iraq. While in Babylon, the Bible tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar put them through this three-year program to make them fully Babylonian. Daniel and his three friends were chosen for this program. You sort of think of it's, 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 there's probably some similar emotions as people have today going to a new job or going off to college. I think for these guys, there was probably a little bit of sense of excitement. It's like, hey, it's a new place to live. What will it be like? I think there's also some fear. It's like, what are they going to teach us? Will, will we be able to hang? Is it going to cause us to compromise our faith? Will we, will we make any new friends? Some fear, some excitement. I mean, part of the excitement was the king chose us. And part of the fear is we don't know what this king's going to require of us. See, it sounds so great on the outside. But when we begin to walk through, what do we see? we see that they're going to be immersed in a totally anti-God culture. They're going to be indoctrinated with pagan beliefs and pagan thoughts. It's not going to be the teaching about the one true God that they knew back home. It's totally different. This Babylonian culture that they're being immersed in was polytheistic in nature, simply meaning there were many gods, not the one true God of Israel. What we're going to see in this environment is that God had them there, and they were indoctrinated, yet they remained faithful to the one true God. They were fully engaged, yet they were faithful to their God. Look at verse 17, Daniel chapter 1. 
To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. I mean, God was not just with them. They did not just stay faithful. But in this culture and in this environment, they excelled. They engaged in the process that the king laid out for them. But on this journey, they did not waver. On this path. They stayed faithful to their God. They did not lose their faith. Again, we have all kinds of choices in our culture. We can go from school to graduate school to the military to the workforce, all kinds of different options. How are we going to respond? This system where Daniel was immersed was totally anti-God. His, his education was going to be filled with myths and superstitions. Occult practices, false science. If you go to the next verse, verse 18. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. So it's like these guys finished their three-year indoctrination program. Now they're brought before the king. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. So when we begin reading this, these young teenage boys are 15 years of age. Three years later, we see they're now 18 years old, and they have excelled. They are now going to be part of the king's court. They're going to be in that environment, become an advisor to the king, the most powerful guy in the world at that time. Verse 20. In every matter of wisdom... And understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them better. He found them, in fact, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So here they are in this pagan, anti God culture. And they don't just get by, they excel. Oh, and I'm reading this, I'm thinking about students today. Maybe at middle school, high school, college, grad school. And all of a sudden you are immersed in a culture and you're going to find teachers and subject matters that don't agree with the values and the teaching of Scripture. And how do we react? Well, there's a test to take and a, and a test to pass. We can learn information. It doesn't mean we believe it. These guys were immersed in that kind of culture, indoctrinated in all kinds of things. And yet, Fully engaged, but what? Faithful. Faithful to their God. I believe there's so much we can learn from the life of Daniel about being engaged in culture and remaining faithful. You look at this idea and you see the fact that there were magicians and enchanters. One of the things to know about the Babylonian culture is they are noted historically for inventing astrology. In fact, some of you may have lunch today at a restaurant and see the Zodiac, right? You're going like, oh, I'm this animal, I'm going here, and this and that. Guess what? Where did that come from? Our friends, the Babylonians. Now, that happens well before Daniel, but they are credited for creating this. And yet we read in Scripture that this is not of God, that we should not depend on the stars to identify human destiny and futures. In fact, here's a couple of chapters you can write down and study on your own some this week. One is Isaiah 47. And in that chapter, God specifies harsh judgment on astrologers who try to use the stars to predict human destiny. And here's another one you can write down, Deuteronomy 18. In Deuteronomy 18, we see that using astrology to seek knowledge about the future is expressly forbidden in Scripture. So again, these guys are in a culture and an environment that screams compromise. Hey, here's how you do life. Here's how we're going to make you Babylonian. And it's not going to center around your God. Yet fully engaged, these guys remained faithful. This morning, I want us to focus on the life of Daniel. And whether you're a student, or whether you are in the workforce, or whether you're a stay-at-home parent, I want us to understand and, and, and try to grasp how can we learn what culture wants to teach us and remain faithful? How can we live and engage in the world that we live in and not cave? How is that possible? You see, as disciples of Jesus, we are called to be engaged with our culture, yet fully faithful 
to God. And how does that happen? So again, whether you're in school, whether you're in the workforce, at home, there are going to be times where you feel attacked. There's going to be times where you are belittled because, oh, you believe the Bible is actually true. There's going to be times you're made fun of. You're going like, oh, you're going to live that kind of morality, the kind that's expressed in Scripture. Be laughed at at times. There may even be times where um, you're called to denounce your faith or to doubt your faith. Daniel teaches us how to live an uncompromising life in a world that screams compromise. So let's walk through some biblical principles that, that are found in Scripture. Because Daniel shows us today how we can live a life faithful to God in a culture that is anything but godly. So how can we remain faithful while living in a secular culture? First thing, we have to decide in advance to live for God. We have to decide in advance to take a stand for God. You see, the time to choose your loyalty is before the test even happens. So before you go to school, before you go off to work, decide this day I am going to be resolute in my decision to stand firm for God. That is exactly what Daniel did. He wasn't surprised, neither should we, that his faith was being called to compromise. It's going to happen to us at school, at work, everywhere else. But Daniel and his friends remained faithful because they prepared in advance to stand for God. Look back at verse 8. But Daniel resolved. It's like he made up in his mind. Before the option was even available or possible, he decided in advance not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to, fi- not to defile himself this way. So again, he resolved. He decided in advance, no, I'm not. Last, our last teaching series was called At Home. And during that series, we laid out a philosophy. We, laid, we, we outlaid a, uh, outlined a strategy that we're going to continue to, to push for years to come. We really do believe that parents and grandparents should be the primary disciplers of their kids, of their children. And so for that two-year window, or that two-decade window, when you have that opportunity and that privilege, how can you leverage your time with spiritual conversations so that when they're faced with the world's challenges, they don't give in, they don't cave. So during those 20 years when kids are in school, prepare them for subjects that they're going to encounter down the road. And so when they're in school, at work, somewhere, and they hear untruth, they know that it's not God's word. And they can say, "Hmm, I hear it, I don't buy it, I'm living this way. I'm going to live God's way. That's what Daniel and his three friends did. They received great instruction when they were at home in Israel from godly parents and family. And they were determined to take a stand whenever opposition appeared. Second key to remaining faithful to God while living in a secular culture is we must steep ourselves in God's word. We must steep ourselves in God's Word. Now, I choose this word steep intentionally. Now, I don't drink uh, coffee or soda or those kind of things, but occasionally on a Sunday morning, I will have a cup of hot tea just to help the scratchy voice here. And so one of the things that I've learned is, you know, if you want to steep some tea, you get some hot water in a tea bag, and you begin to sort of like dip it, go up and down slowly in order to extract every bit of flavor from that tea bag that you can. You can't just slam it in once and be done. You just have hot water, not so tasteful. So what is it? You steep it. You go slow. That's how we must immerse ourselves in God's Word. We want to steep ourselves. It's like if you're flying across the country. You say you're going from Dulles to San Diego. You're at 40,000 feet going 600 miles an hour. What do you see? Not much. What happens if you were to take a car or a train or walk or a bike? It's a lot slower, but you see a lot more detail. You see a lot more things. If you just go really fast, you miss it. 
That's why we must steep ourselves in God's word. It is a slow process of taking a deep, rich look at his holy word. If we're going to live in a culture and remain faithful, we've got to be immersed, steeped in God's holy word. Yes, we can take a stand. But to take a stand on his truth, we've got to know his word. There's a situation, a time in the life of Israel where Joshua is assuming leadership from another leader named Moses. Joshua is going to eventually lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And as that transition in leadership is happening, God has some very direct words for Joshua about his leadership. And listen to what he says. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. It's like, hey, I want you to steep yourself in the Word, slowly immersing. Over and over, extracting all of the flavor, every morsel of spiritual life and nutrients that God has for you in his word. I want you to get those so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. See, really the only way for us to face the world, the only way for us to really take a stand for God is to be steeped in his word. I'm privileged to be a part of a small group that meets on Wednesday nights. We're currently studying um, cults and counterfeit gospels in our small group. And on this, in the midst of this study, we've, dis we've discovered that for us to be able to discern false, fake, phony lies, we must know the truth. That's what we must know. We've got to know the truth of God's word to be able to expose something that's false, a false gospel. And there are all kinds of lies around us, false gospels about worldviews and cultural lies, moral lies, political lies, on and on and on. But what we must know is the one true gospel in order to highlight and point out the false. So here's an example that was from our study. It's talking about a $20 bill. A $20 bill um, is currently the most counterfeited bill in the American currency. There's currently, in totality, about $150 million of counterfeit money floating around our country. But how do you know if this is false or true? How do you know if this is good money or phony money? And you might, well, does it really matter? Um, when you go to deposit it, it does matter. They won't give it any, you won't have any money if it's all false or, folk, or, or phony. So the Secret Service, the Treasury Department, has five different tests, at least, to say, hey, this is good, this is bad. Here's one. Uh, at the bottom right, you look for this color-shifting ink. It appears as copper, but if you begin to turn the money a little bit, it turns greenish. So you look for color-shifting ink. Another one is the watermark off to the right of the portrait. Uh, that watermark is actually embedded in the paper. It's not printed, and it's visible from both sides. Very tough to do. A lot of technology involved in that, obviously. So that's one test that you can look at. Another is the security thread to the left of the portrait. It goes up and down there, the little skinny strip to the left of the portrait. It's embedded, and you can take a look at and see if there's a security thread there. You have to hold it up to light. Another test is if you hold it up to ultraviolet light, it glows a different color depending on the denomination of the bill. A $20 bill will glow green, and a $50 bill will glow yellow. It's like, oh, that's good to know. The fifth thing is the serial number. When you look at the serial number, it begins with a letter, and there's a letter corresponding to each year. If you look at the letter E, this bill was printed in 2004. If it was a J, it was printed in 2009. Now, here's the deal. It's really not about money. A person who is trained to identify the fake, the phony, the counterfeit, what do you think they study? They study the real. These people don't go out and say, I, I want to know everything I can about a phony bill. No, no, no. The measuring stick is knowing the real. It's the true. It's the authentic. You don't study the inauthentic to find the authentic. You study the authentic to prove it's inauthentic. 
And so that is us. As we study God's word together, we are learning truth. We're steeping ourselves in God's word so that we can identify false doctrine, false gospel, counterfeit gospels. Because if we're going to take a stand, we've got to be able to know the truth on which to stand. So maybe you're going like, okay, dude, I get it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to steep myself. I'm happy to immerse myself in God's word. I want to know the true, not the false, the fake, the phony. How do I do it? I listed a couple of great uh, options on the back of your sermon notes. One of them there is called Right Now Media. Right Now Media has thousands of great studies. Our church pays for a church-wide license so that anybody in our church can have access to all the content, not just some. So if you're like, hey, yeah, I'd like to do that on my own and do some studies. There are certain topics. Hey, um... You can email Debbie, and she will set you up with, a, your, you, with your own information so that you can access all of the content on Right Now Media. Another great resource is gotquestions.org. Maybe you're wanting to study about the grace. Uh, maybe you're going like, what is that thing called the substitutionary atonement about? You can type in a search engine at gotquestions.org, and they give uh, great biblical references to the question that you have submitted. So again... Those are free, and they're great tools to help you steep yourself in God's Word. So as you're studying, something comes up. Those are great, great resources. So if we're going to remain faithful to God in a secular culture, we've got to decide to take a stand. But as we're taking the stand, we've got to know what to stand for, and that's why we must steep ourselves in God's Word. Another component, another principle from God's Word we see in the life of Daniel is make godly relationships your closest relationships. Make godly relationships your closest relationships. One of the reasons Daniel makes it through this three-year indoctrinational program, Faith Intact, is he had three guys he was doing life with. He has these buddies, and they're going through this together. Now, when you see that, that doesn't mean that you and I should not have unbelievers as friends. How can we be salt and light? How can we share the gospel with people if we don't have some unbelieving friends along the way? But again, it's our closest relationships. The ones we spend the most time with should be those who are also pursuing Jesus with us. They are fellow disciples on this journey. So again, our best friends, the ones we hang out with the most, the ones we spend the most time with, should be like-minded disciples. Because we understand and realize that not every Um, unbeliever is a bad influence, but neither is every believer a good influence. So you're going, well, how do I figure this out? You just ask your question, man. Am I becoming more like Jesus hanging around this person? Am I becoming more and more like Christ by doing life with them? And then pursue those as your closest relationships. Paul tells the believers at Corinth, do not be misled Bad company re- corrupts good character. Again, the filter. Are the people I'm hanging out with the most helping me pursue Jesus? You see, in the context of a church, the best place for these godly relationships to happen are in, is in small groups. Again, I'm privileged to be a part of one. Many of you have made that commitment that every week you're going to gather with like-minded disciples and study God's Word. Some of you are like, hey, that's the first I heard of it. Or maybe you're going like, hey, I used to be in one uh, there was a season in my life where I couldn't, now I'm ready. You may be here going like, I don't even know what they do. I would encourage you again to stop by the information counter, ask Debbie or one of her team members, what are these things called small groups? How can I get engaged? How can I get involved? They will be glad to assist you. You see, we're learning from the life of Daniel. How can we live in our culture today and remain faithful to God? We decide in advance we're going to stand for God. We steep ourselves ourselves in God's word. We have godly relationships as our closest relationships. Why does it matter? It matters because we as disciples are called to be engaged with our culture yet remain faithful to the one true God. And you're going like, is that possible? Dara, have you been out there lately? It's hard. It's tough. And I agree with you. It is tough. And I want to see if if maybe this word picture can be a source of encouragement to you. Um, And I'll start it with a question before I give you the picture. How many of you have been deep sea fishing before? Anybody? I see those hands. I made that mistake once. (laughs) All right? Once. Just once. 
Uh, I was with some friends, and we went out, and if you were to see me in a pair of shorts, you would look at my knees, and you will see scars there from where I slid around on the deck of this boat hurling for seven hours. <laughs> All right? The guys caught lots of fish thanks to me that day. Okay? <laughs> they caught lots of fish. Um, I was a great chummer for them. But that's another story. If you're able to survive on a ship, you might land something that looks like this. You're going like, that is beautiful and it's tasty. Thank you, Jesus, for creating those beautiful creatures. They're so yummy. But this fish lived its entire life in salt water. Briny water so salty that if you were to ingest it, it could be deadly. Definitely make you sick at best. But you, you land this fish. You get back to, to shore, back to dock. There's a guy there who says, hey, you know, 50 bucks, I'll, I'll clean it and ice it for you. You take it home. You get ready to prepare it. It's going to put it on the grill. It's going to be delicious. What's one ingredient you add to this fish? Oh, you guys are... You add salt. So, so, so stay with me. This is not about fishing. My contention is, is this great creator God who created that beautiful creature to live in briny, salty water and yet protect it from its culture can do that for us. Our great God can allow us to be in the environment that might even kill some things, but we thrive as we point people toward Him. You see, some people come at this and say, well, listen, if I'm going to really live in this world and engage the culture, I'm just going to imitate it. So that's what some people will say. I'm just going to imitate the world. But that's not the solution. That's not the path, the answer. It's not what Daniel and his buds did. They didn't imitate and just, oh, whatever goes is fine. Everybody else is doing it. I guess I will too. They didn't imitate the world. But neither did they go to the other extreme and isolate themselves from the world. I'm just going to isolate myself. I'm going to become a pilgrim. I'm going to become a nun. I'm going to a monastery. I'm never going to associate with those people out there. That's not why Daniel did either. And his buddies, they were in this three-year program, and they were fully engaged with their culture. So, imitating, being like everybody else is a solution. Isolating and just keeping ourselves from anything of the world. Can't be salt and light that way. What's the, what's the answer? I think the answer is the same thing that we see in that fish. That our great God can insulate that fish. If he can do that, he can insulate us. We can be in this world and pure. We can be in this world and protected. We can be in this world and not be polluted. Our God, we take a stand with him. We steep ourselves in His Word. We have godly people with us. We can be insulated from this world. And when we're insulated, we can have an influence and an impact in this world, just like Daniel did in his. Two of the emperors he served became followers of God because of his life. And who in this world is going to become a follower of Jesus because of your life, because of your message? Maybe you're here this morning and you start to reflect on your life a bit. And I would say, you know, have, have you fallen into that first trap of being an imitator of the world? Have you drifted that way? Have you drifted to where you're living like the world, you're in it, and you're of it? It's like there's no distinction between you and 3,000 other people who don't follow Jesus. I would just encourage you to repent of that and realize that God can insulate you. You can live in this world. Be fully engaged and still faithful. But to do that, you're going to have to follow God's word. Take a stand. Steep yourself. Surround yourself with godly people. Let me ask you, has your idea of surviving this world just been to isolate yourself? Hey, I'm going to have this group, and this is going to be my little holy, holy huddle over here, and I'm going to have all these great Christian friends here, but yet you're not engaging culture. You're not building relationships with people far from God. 
Again, we must impact and influence our culture, our world. So say, maybe this morning it's confessing, God, I, I don't need to live a life of isolation. No, no, confess that. God, point me in the direction of relationships that need to be changed so that I can be your ambassador, your voice box. Help me, Jesus. Follow those steps to immerse yourself in God's word. Stay faithful. Maybe you're here this morning, and you have done a great job insulating yourself. You're going like, hey, you're, I, I go to school. I'm in college. I go to work. Whatever. And you know what? I'm, I'm not drifting. I feel like I'm espousing truth, that I'm, I have relationships with people outside of faith. My closest buds, well, you know, we're, we're tight in faith, and we're trying our best to have an influence. And I'd say, hey, great job. Keep it up. Just like Daniel. Let's pray that some people trust and follow Jesus because of your witness. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never trusted and followed Jesus. Maybe for you, you know, you've gone back and forth between just isolating yourself, doing your own thing, or maybe in the seasons of doing whatever the world does around you. But you realize, you know what? Um, that faith that Daniel had, the faith that we see taught throughout Scripture is not one that I have. Maybe this morning you want to commit to following Jesus and the truth of God's word. And when you've become that follower, he will begin to insulate you and grow you so that you too can live in our culture and remain faithful to our great God. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. God, we want to engage our culture and not lose our faith. Help each of us to follow the steps that we discussed earlier from your word, from the life of Daniel, of how to remain faithful to you while living in a secular culture. God, with your help, Daniel was able to, and we trust you to lead us in the same fashion. And God, I pray for those here today who maybe have never trusted and followed you. God, I pray that today would be the day that they give you their whole life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.